Yeah, so it's been quite a journey since the beginning of this campaign. Huh? So let's go for the grand finale of this series of Napoleon in Italy. January 1797. A new year, but familiar problems for 27-year-old General Bonaparte, waging war against the Austrians in northern Italy. He has the great fortress city of Mantua under siege. And after a narrow victory at Arcole, he's once again driven back the Austrian armies, trying to march to its aid. But the French army of Italy is in a ragged state. Troops have not been paid for weeks. Their uniforms are disintegrating. Their shoes are broken. And above all, they're hungry. We have a say in France that any idiot can raise an army right up until dinner time. One of Napoleon's major concerns is the wretched state of medical care for his men. The hospitals lack everything. Our wounded are lying on the floors and in the most horrible state of destitution. It's not just a question of saving lives and getting wounded men back to their units. Medical care affects morale. As troops going into combat want to know that if the worst happens, they'll be looked after. So, during the course of this series, much has been said about psychology and how Napoleon used it to motivate its soldier. But you can't compete with the vision of what can happen to you if you're wounded or the sight of a dead man. Uh, it's, it's beyond anything Napoleon can say to them. And on top of that, bad medical conditions are also a perfect breeding ground for new diseases. It's like a vicious circle. <laughs> Conditions are much worse for the Austrian garrison of Mantua, commanded by Field Marshal Wurmser. In four months of siege, 9,000 soldiers have died from disease, wounds, or the effects of malnutrition. Survivors live off horse meat, civilians off rats and dogs. Even these miserable rations will run out by the 27th of January, just a few weeks away. The clock is ticking. The Austrians must relieve Mantua by that date, or lose the city. And with it, the war in Italy. Since the beginning of this campaign, so like six months ago, he's only received one tenth of what the Austrian sent. He's received 3,500 guys, whereas the Austrians sent him three full armies. Napoleon, having received just 7,000 reinforcements, prepares to meet Alvinci's advance. Okay, one fifth. Um, yeah. He will not only be outnumbered, he doesn't know where his enemy will strike. And now it's time to introduce to you a new concept uh, developed by Bonaparte during this campaign at, at this point, the strategic quadrilateral. So you occupy four positions, uh, one at Peschiera and Rivoli, another one at Verona, Legnano, and the final one at Mantua. So these four positions are separated from 30 to 40 kilometers, which means that it's reachable within one day of March. If one of them is in the presence of, the, of a small army, it can ignore it and let it pass to Mantua, where this small army will be trapped. 
uh, and cut off from supply lines. But on the other hand, if one corner of this strategic quadrilateral is attacked by a large army, the others must converge. And thus, Napoleon kind of neglects the uncertainty of where the Austrian will strike. And Napoleon must hold one division back to cover Wormser's garrison. It's commanded once more by General Serrurier, recovered from his long illness. Augereau's division watches the Adige, while Massena guards Verona. The northern division has a new commander. Napoleon has sacked Vaubois for his poor performance and put in his place General Barthélemy Joubert. So, Joubert is a very interesting guy. He enlisted as a simple soldier in 1791, so five years from that. He rose to the ranks through courage and bravery. In one occasion, he defended a redoubt against the Piedmontese charge with its bayonet, for he had no munitions left. That kind of heroism is what made him a general of the Republic, and it's a strong symbol of the new spirit within the French army. He is a hard-working, brave, and exceptionally modest commander, and, like Napoleon, just 27 years old. General Ray is in reserve, south of Lake Garda. General Alvinci has received 14,000 reinforcements and orders to relieve Mantua as soon as possible. He is eager to march, but heavy snow and the late arrival of equipment and supplies delays his advance until the 7th of January. The first columns on the move are Provera and Berlich, but their offensive is merely a diversion intended to draw Napoleon's attention away from the main threat, which will be coming down the Adige Valley. Alvinci has divided this force into six columns. Their mission is to envelop and destroy Joubert's division at Rivoli and clear the path to Mantua. But Rivoli is a strong defensive position. They must hit it hard and fast before the French can respond. Napoleon, assuming any Austrian advance is still weeks away, has travelled to the Papal States with a column of troops commanded by Colonel Lann. They intend to put a little pressure on the Pope, who continues to stir opposition to France. However, as soon as he receives reports of enemy movement, Napoleon races back to his headquarters at Rovabella. By now, Alvinci's forces have also begun to advance, but serious planning failures quickly emerge. Lusignan's first column, on the right flank of the advance, has orders to cross the slopes of Monte Baldo and attack Joubert from the rear. It's soon clear that these orders are wildly optimistic, dreamed up by staff officers who'd not seen the terrain. The peak of Monte Baldo is more than 7,000 feet high. Its slopes are covered in deep snow and ice. The paths are treacherous, even more so after dark, and there is no firewood for making camp. Only by taking a wide detour can Lusignan make any progress at all. Well, and this place is not far from where the Austrians and the Italians will fight during World War I. And fighting there was already uh, like a logistical progress one century after this campaign. So imagine with 18th century logistical means what it meant. At this point, even fighting under the rain can massively impact the outcome of a battle. Yeah, maneuvering through the Alps without any proper logistical is kind of 
I will put it lightly, I cannot make any sense of it. Just losing 200 men to exhaustion and exposure. Meanwhile, the second and third Austrian columns reach the French outpost at Ferrara. An initial attack is repulsed. And following their orders, they wait for Lusignan's column to appear before launching a second attack. However, Lusignan's column is not yet in sight. Alvinci's plan relies on swift, bold action. But just 48 hours in, it's falling apart. At Roverbella, Napoleon ponders the incoming reports. He knows that Joubert's forward outpost is under attack at Ferrara, that Massena has repulsed an Austrian attack on Verona, and Augereau faces a sizeable Austrian force near Legnago, poised to cross the Adige. Is Alvinci using the same tactics as before, making his attack from the east? Then, a second report arrives from Joubert. His scouts have detected an enemy column marching around his flank. He has no doubt that he faces a major Austrian attack, and has begun withdrawing his forces to Rivoli. The report I have given you is exact, he tells his chief. Be assured, the enemy will make every effort to throw me onto the blockade of Mantua. The enemy's plan has been unmasked, Napoleon announces, and issues a flurry of orders. Massena is to march immediately to reinforce Joubert. Augereau is to send him cavalry and guns, while the rest of his division keeps watch on Provera. Here you can see the benefits of the, the strategic quadrilateral I mentioned, is that you can wait on these two sides to see whether these are serious attacks or not and when the main offensive is spotted then you can converge to the position. Ray is to move up to Castelnuovo. Servurier is to be on high alert for an attempted breakout by the Mantua garrison. While Joubert, the youngest and least experienced of Napoleon's divisional commanders, is instructed to hold Rivoli at any cost, and assured that help is on the way. After giving the Austrians a bloody nose at Ferrara, Joubert has extricated his troops overnight and taken up a defensive position around Rivoli. Napoleon arrives around midnight and immediately sets out with Joubert to inspect the enemy's positions. The weather had cleared and the moonlight was superb. I climbed the different heights and observed the lines of enemy fires. They filled the country between the Adige and Lake Garda, and the atmosphere was ablaze with them. It must have been quite a frightening sight to see all these fire camps, and it requires iron nerves in order to keep your composure in front of this vision. The way Napoleon overcomes this is that is, uh, you know, a mathematical and very logical mind, and he inspects the battlefield, you know, like a technician before every battle. And he has a deep knowledge, and he has he can control every factor, so he can make a plan out of it. One could easily distinguish five camps, each composed of a column. 
Until reinforcements arrive, Napoleon has just Joubert's division, 10,000 men, to hold off 24,000 Austrians. But Alvinci will help to even the odds, by ordering Lusignan's first column to attempt a wide outflanking march, to cut off the French line of retreat. And on this position, if you're the defender, uh, you can easily create bottlenecks, I mean like here or here, where you can kind of easily neglect your opponent's numerical advantage. And Napoleon decides the main road to Rivoli, which passes through a steep defile known as the Pontari, can be held by a single regiment supported by entrenched cannon. This leaves more manageable odds of 9,000 against 12,000 in the centre. But Napoleon wants to push out his defensive line to hold the slopes that mark the edge of the Rivoli Plateau. At 4am, General Vial's Light Infantry Brigade advances through the darkness. They drive back the Austrian outposts and take the San Marco Chapel. They're followed on their left by the rest of Joubert's division. But the French push too far. Skirmishes break out along the line with heavy fighting on the heights of San Marco. Napoleon had not wanted to start the battle so early, but the combat escalates. At dawn, the Austrians attack the plateau in force. The French 85th Demi Brigade is outflanked and routed by Lipte's second column. The 29th Light, on its right, is forced to retreat, and it looks like the French line is crumbling. But the 14th, on their right, fights tenaciously. It's an intense infantry battle across broken ground, vineyards and walled gardens, with sudden charges, hurried withdrawals and counter-charges. When the Austrians overrun a French battery, an officer demands, 14th, will you let them take your guns? His troops mount a ferocious charge that routs the Austrians and reclaims the battery. The French are in kind of a desperate situation, so they will fight with this energy, you know, with the determination of someone who does not want to die. By 9am, Massena's troops have begun to arrive. They take up position on Joubert's left. The buckled French line is stabilised. But so far, the French have only faced half of Alvinci's six columns. One by one, the others now join the action. Vukasovic's sixth column is on the far side of the Adige River. But its guns cause havoc among French troops holding the Pontari. Under this covering fire, Roy shells do not explode, shell bounce over and you know roll like uh, in, a, in bowling uh, through the troops. If you're like here, um, perpendicular to the line, and if your shells roll over this, the effect is devastating. Royce's fifth column charges up the narrow road and in fierce fighting storms the French entrenchments. This advance threatens the entire French right wing with encirclement and a retreat begins. Moments later, gunfire to the southwest reveals Lusignan's first column has reached Affy, poised to cut off their escape. The French situation is desperate. They are outnumbered, surrounded and under heavy attack. Napoleon's staff look anxiously to their commander, wondering what miracle can save the army now. Hours. 
So at this point, <laughs> either you've lost it or you're a genius. One thing I think we should emphasize more during this whole campaign is the composure and the calm of Napoleon amid chaos. It's like desperation turns him into a super saiyan where he, his vision becomes sharper, his reflexes are more and more accurate. And yeah, we'll see this kind of behavior from Napoleon very later, for example, in the French campaign of 1814, where his back is against the wall and is finding back all of its skills. Sensing victory, General Alvinci and his staff ride forward to urge his infantry on. Napoleon remains calm. He knows Alvinci's centre columns are near exhaustion and that they have no cavalry and little artillery support. He identifies Royce's column as the most immediate threat and orders Joubert to send every man and gun he can spare for a counterattack. General Leclerc and a 21-year-old Captain Lasalle then charge with the entire French cavalry, just a few hundred horsemen. Under this onslaught, the lead Austrian troops are driven back into the gorge. Here, they collide with the rest of the column coming up. Cavalry and infantry jammed together, some pushing forward, others trying to escape. Joubert's men pour fire down on them from the overlooking ridge. The final straw is the devastating explosion of an ammunition wagon. Austrian morale breaks. The survivors flood back down the road to safety. Napoleon now turns his full attention to the center, where the... So see how he let them advance and overstretch, whereas its forces are very much concentrated. And here I think about his quote, never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake. The exhausted Austrian columns have become spread out and disordered. The sudden appearance of French cavalry, supported by infantry and guns, sparks panic and a mass rout. Alvinci, who must have thought himself on the cusp of victory moments before, must join in an undignified race to the rear, spreading further alarm among his men. By 1pm, the bulk of the Austrian army is in headlong retreat leaving Lusignan's first column in an awkward position. Completely isolated, he begins a fighting withdrawal. But the arrival of General Ray's brigade in his rear triggers a rout. Fewer than half of his 4,000 men escape. Through tenacity, courage and good fortune, the army of Italy has turned a grim situation into an astonishing triumph. French casualties are modest. Austrian losses are devastating. Over the next few days, 5,000 more Austrians are captured as they struggle back through the mountain passes. Napoleon will not be there to see it. He's received news that Provera has crossed the Adige and is marching on Mantua. It is a chance for him to strike one more blow against the enemy and to seal the fate of Mantua. Joubert in command at Rivoli, with orders to renew the attack at dawn, Napoleon races south with Massena's division. 
Provera has no clue of the disaster that's engulfed Alvinci's army, nor that the wolves now gather for him. He pushes on to Mantua, shadowed by Ogero, who snaps up his rearguard, 2,000 men taken prisoner. So here you can perfectly see the advantage of the strategic quadrilateral, and this one is hard for me to pronounce. They led through these Austrian troops who are now completely cut off from any supply line or even any retreat possibility. And uh, yeah, we, well, we can see where this is going. With just 7,000 left, Provera's only hope is to break through the French siege lines. First, he tries to attack San Giorgio. Formidable French defences and a powerful cannonade stop him cold. The next day, he launches a coordinated attack with Wormser against French forces at La Favorita. But Napoleon has now arrived with Massena's division from the north. Wormser's weak, starving men are forced back into the citadel, while a determined charge by the 57th Demi Brigade smashes into Provera's flank. With Augereau approaching from the east, Provera faces impossible odds and surrenders with his entire force. Wormser's last hope of rescue has been crushed. He puts off the inevitable for two agonizing weeks. Until, with all food exhausted, he finally accepts terms for Mantua's surrender on the 2nd of February. He and an escort will return to Austria. His 16,000 remaining troops become prisoners. Austrian losses in the campaign reach a staggering 44,000 men. After eight months, to give credit to Wurmser for its absolute determination. Uh, but I can say also a bit stubborn now at this point, because waiting two weeks when you have no prospect of uh, any relief, when your men are dying every day in horrible, horrible conditions, mm, yeah. The siege of Mantua is over. A victory that will soon be celebrated on the streets of Paris. But it is General Serrurier, not Napoleon, who takes the formal Austrian surrender. His commander-in-chief has already departed to take on his next opponent, the Pope. Pius VI has once more been agitating against the French, and so Napoleon marches south with 9,000 men to explain the new realities of power in Italy. I love this line, marching south with its army to explain something to the Pope. Uh, and so the Pope is uh, both a spiritual leader and also a secular ruler. He's in charge of the Papal State. He can act as any other sovereign around him. At Faenza, General Victor's division sweeps aside Papal forces, and Ancona is taken without a fight. The subsequent Treaty of Tolentino forces the Pope to give up Romagna, as well as 30 million francs and a hundred works of art. Belatedly, Napoleon's victories persuade the Directory to back him in force. French armies stuck on the Rhine 
are ordered to send him reinforcements. Their 34-year-old commander, another rising star of the French army, is congratulated on his brilliant winter crossing of the Alps. His name is General Jean Bernadotte. Shout out to my Swedish friends. Uh, Bernadotte is the future, future king of Sweden and he will be a formidable opponent for Napoleon. On the 10th of March, with 70,000 confident, seasoned troops under his command, Napoleon goes on the offensive. He sends Joubert to invade the Tyrol, Massena to advance up the Piave Valley, while he leads the bulk of the army on the most direct road to Vienna. The enemy is scattered and demoralised. Even the appointment of a new commander, the Emperor's own brother, Archduke Charles, fails to restore morale. Charles is regarded as a military prodigy. He's two years younger than Napoleon, and has defeated the armies of both General Jourdan and Moreau in Germany. But Charles is a brilliant strategist, and later he will inflict Napoleon's first significant defeat at Aspern. But before that, he will need to reform the Austrian army because a general is still a technician and he needs tools as, for example, an army. And at this point, he does not have one. But he does not have enough troops or time. He fights a delaying action at the Tagliamento River. But it ends in disaster when Bernadotte surrounds and captures 2,000 Austrians, 10 guns and 8 standards. The French pursuit continues, with Massena covering Napoleon's northern flank. And see here how with two battles, I mean one decisive battle, we can say one, the Battle of Rivoli is uh, what changes everything after months of struggle uh, and after that last battle at Mantua is just the outcome but when with one decisive battle Napoleon clears everything and basically there's nothing left in front of him and I think this will fuel in his mind the myth of the decisive battle where the outcome of a war can be decided with one single engagement. He arrives at Tarvis in time to block the Austrians' retreat. In three days fighting, the French take another 3,000 prisoners. Napoleon's troops outmarch and outfight the Austrians at every turn. But his situation is more precarious than it seems. The other French armies are only just crossing the Rhine, while his own supply lines are now overextended and vulnerable. Rather than withdraw, Napoleon continues to advance, while proposing to Archduke Charles that they open peace negotiations. The Austrians accept. Two days later, both sides agree an armistice, and peace talks begin at Leoben. After five years of conflict, Napoleon's dazzling advance into Austria has brought the War of the First Coalition to an end. So ends Napoleon's first campaign almost exactly a year after it began, 380 miles away on the shores of the Mediterranean. And he'll keep this bond 
with, for example, addressing to single soldiers directly and say, you, and he quotes the name of the soldier, you were with me at Lodi, San Giorgio, Arcole, you are all brave. And then he takes a medal out of his chest and put it to the soldier's chest. Negotiations at Leoben become the basis for the Treaty of Campo Formio, signed five months later. The Austrian Netherlands, roughly modern Belgium, formally passed to France. The Venetian Republic, invaded and systematically looted by Napoleon's troops, is divided between France and Austria. So ends the 1200-year history of the Serene Republic of Venice. The famous horses of St. Mark are among its many treasures dispatched to the Louvre in Paris, to join its rapidly expanding Italian collection. We'll give this back, don't worry. The French part of Venice joins its other Italian client states to form a new Cisalpine Republic. The author of its constitution, Napoleon Bonaparte. He's training for the Code Civil. It's an illustration of how far the 27-year-old general has come in just a year. Having waged one of the most brilliant military campaigns in history, many would say his best, he now dictates terms to kings and popes, summons new states into being, and nurtures his status as the most celebrated military commander in Europe. He has achieved all this thanks to formidable intelligence, relentless hard work, and inspiring leadership which he has used to forge a unique bond of trust with his men. He's had luck, too, along the way, and been ably served by a group of brilliant officers, many of whom will be with him for years to come. Maybe one guy we've not mentioned a lot, even almost not at all during this whole campaign, uh, for his in Napoleon's shadow, his Berthier, his aide de camp, and the man who is the keystone for the execution of Napoleon's orders. For Napoleon still has many extraordinary things to achieve. His Italian campaign is just the first chapter in one of the most astonishing lives in history. Did you know? So, now we enter a new era where a 27-year-old general can impose its will to a century-old monarchy. So, we are at the end of this series. Thank you so much for following it. Of course, I'll keep on talking about Napoleon on this channel, but for the time being, maybe a couple of other adventures. Thank you very much, and thanks to SPK Story TV for this fantastic job, and I wish you all a very nice day. Bye.